I'm Brad Dacus, President and Founder of the Pacific Justice Institute. Welcome to Faith and Law. Now let's take a look at this latest trending video. After weeks of back and forth, the Los Angeles Dodgers invite the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence to their Pride Night. The decision has sparked passionate voices on both sides of the debate. Um, this is where we are. Uh, our nation is now allowing for open salute of abomination before God. They're mocking God. They're mocking the cross. And they're doing it there at the Dodger Stadium. It's not like they're just doing it in some public park somewhere. Folks, this, this is the, the, uh, the Dodgers at their stadium before a game, uh, openly uh, pushing this and promoting this. Uh, this is something that is an insult to people of faith. See, how is it an insult? Well, let's, pre let's pretend that they instead had a KKK uh, ceremony, a KKK a recognition night. What would that communicate to people who are minorities, to, to, to Jewish individuals, to African-American individuals? Uh, it'd be a slap in the face. But what they'd be communicating is that they can do this slap in the face and they expect everyone to still come to their game. They, they expect people not to value who they are in God, who they are in Christ, uh, who they are based upon the laws of nature and nature's God. Basically, it's an insult to us to, to, for them to imply that we don't really even value our own selves. We don't, as Christians, in this case, we don't value our faith. We don't value our God. You can mock our God. You can uh, dis disgrace our God and the message of the gospel. And we, as, as Christians, we really don't care. You can stomp all over us. We really don't care. Go ahead and put us in the back of the bus. We don't care. That's the message they're expecting. And the good news is that when it came time for the second round and they did this kind of a recognition deal during, uh, right before a game, what happened? Well, no one showed. We sent a message that we were not going to play into this. Well, you know what? The message isn't just for that one game. The message needs to be for the next game, the next game, and the next game. Bottom line, folks, we need to send a loud message that it's not just a mild inconvenience. No, this is something we will not tolerate. And when you do this, you're basically saying, Dodgers, we don't value you. And we need to re respond with that, saying we will not put up with this. We're not going to any of your Dodger games, period, period. Well, the fact is, these kinds of assaults on people of faith, it's not just in the stadiums, it's actually in the workplace all across America. And help talk about one of these cases, I'd like to invite to the show now David Peters. He's our attorney out of our Michigan office. Welcome to the show, David. Appreciate you being here. Now, David, uh, this case that we're going to talk about now, you're handling a number of them, but the one I want to talk about now is dealing with an, a woman who has been working uh, for a caretaker facility uh, for, for quite a while. And uh, she was told to suddenly, after so many years of being there, to refer to a co-worker by a different gender pronoun, a different name, a different gender pronoun. Uh, this, is, uh, this is outrageous stuff. You know, first, David, you know, how long has she been working here, this worker at this, this caretaker facility? Hi, Brad. Great to be on with you again. Yeah, uh, this is a 66-year-old woman. She had been working at this facility for um, several years. She had worked alongside another young woman uh, in her early 20s. I think she was um, 19 when she started working there. And she was a girl. And our client is 66 years old. And one day, this young girl came into the office and said, uh, I'm a man now and demanded to be addressed by her or his female or male pronouns and you know our, our client a christian little old church lady said uh no i i'm not going to use 
false pronouns for you. You're a girl. And uh, by the way, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And he is the way, the truth, and the light. And I will not live in a lie and be with Jesus. Okay, now, did she have a good record? Did she have a, anything in her, her files that would say she was doing a bad job? Was she, was she coming to work late? Uh, was there any reason to fire her based upon her work performance? Uh, Brad, absolutely not. No, um, you know, this case is not about work performance. And and the client, she has a good work record. She's never been fired from a job, but that's not why she was fired. She absolutely fired because she refused to play the pronoun game, because she refused to utter a lie with her own lips. So I understand this was a woman of, of faith, of, of Christian faith. Uh, what was her religious conviction uh, with regards to the request by this coworker? Yeah, Brad, the, uh, this case is about compelled speech. Uh, and, and that is generally frowned on in our system. You, can, you are not required to say things. Uh, you may be prohibited from saying things, but you're not required to say things, as in this case. Well, David, I think the majority of Christians throughout America would agree with her, frankly. And I think she should have a good case. But does she? Do you think she's going to prevail? Uh, so we are very confident that we'll have a good outcome in this case. Uh, as, as I say, we, we could already have a pretty good outcome now. Um, and, and I think, again, legally, we've already had a good outcome because this case was permitted to go to trial. Uh, and that means all other similar cases in the Western District of Michigan are, are likely going to be permitted to go to trial. And we have struck a very strong blow against this uh, transgender pronoun and compelled speech. Well, David, thank you very much for the work you're doing on that and many other cases on uh, behalf of Pacific Justice Institute. God bless you. And folks, let's pray for this woman. Let's pray for her case that she will see justice one way or the other. God bless you, David. Now, folks, I have some big news involving a matter that we've been involved with in the state of Nevada. And to help talk about this, we have the attorney who is right there in the front of the battle, attorney Emily Mimna. Uh, Emily, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you, Brad. Now, Emily, I understand that there has been a bill that has been placed on the desk of the governor that legalizes assisted suicide, right? That's right, Brad. This bill, SB 239, would legalize suicide as a medical treatment in the state of Nevada for conditions that are deemed terminal. The, the bill is the handiwork of a group aptly titled the Hemlock Society. And the Hemlock Society is exactly what it sounds like. Their goal is to legitimize suicide as a medical treatment for terminal conditions. They've been pushing this legislation here in Nevada for the better part of a decade. And in the course of that advocacy, they have renamed, rebranded themselves as Compassionate Choices. And I would say it is neither compassionate nor really a choice to be foisted upon a vulnerable individual who is facing a potentially terminal diagnosis. So that is SB 239, handiwork of the Hemlock Society, placed on the desk of our governor, Governor, governor uh, Lombardo. So, Emily, if this bill had been signed by the governor, what would it have authorized with regard to assisted suicide? This bill would legalize the distribution of deadly drugs meant to kill a patient. The bill allows a physician or certain types of nurses even to decide with a patient that because they may have less than six months to live, the patient should decide to kill themselves. And it, it's worth noting there is no FDA drug approved for this purpose. Instead, what this bill says is that we will allow doctors and some nurses to experiment with a combination of drugs and design a custom cocktail specifically for the purpose of killing the patient. And once that is done, there is no mandatory investigation, no follow-up, no notification of family, no actual query as to what happened. In fact, the bill requires coroners to falsify the death certificate, to lie, to lie and say that the patient was not killed by this cocktail was not a victim of suicide. It requires the coroner to lie and say that the cause of death was actually the underlying condition, whatever prompted the terminal diagnosis. 
this is probably pretty shocking for people to hear that such a bill like this would even exist. But are there actually other states that have adopted assisted suicide legislation like this? Yes, Brad, there are 10 jurisdictions, 11 counting D.C., that have some form of assisted suicide. However, I would say none of those jurisdictions adopted any type of law quite as extreme as what's being proposed here in Nevada. California, for example, originally adopted an assisted suicide scheme that at least had, for example, a sunset clause, meaning that the law would only be in in place and on the books for a limited certain period of time and subject to review. Here in Nevada, we don't even have that very limited protection. And what we've also seen in states like Washington, Oregon, California, Maine, Delaware, is when you even have these very minimal, flimsy so-called safety rails, those are removed. As it just the, 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 the fact is that they're removed over the course of time. Now, when many people hear of assisted suicide, they often think, well, it's, it's probably like a week or maybe two weeks before the person's about to die. Uh, what's exactly the, the time frame that this legislation would have allowed for assisted suicides to take place? Uh, a week, uh, two weeks before de uh, projected death. What are we talking about here? Six months, Brad. Anyone who is told that they have a terminal condition with less than six months to live is suddenly eligible to receive this deadly experimental cocktail. And it really is, it's coercive to tell someone that this is a viable option, that this is something that you should be seriously considering, that it would ease the burden on your family, it would relieve perhaps financial considerations. It, it really, it denies the fundamental dignity of every individual. And, and really, I, I, we have this on the record from doctors, physicians, nurses, people on both ends of the political spectrum who testified to say six months is an estimate. It's, it's, never, it, it's never certain. And it, it, it really is a, a guess. And it's an estimate. And it's coercive to tell an individual that the Possibly the best choice for you right now is to just kill yourself. That's what you should be doing, not getting support, getting counseling, reaching out to your pastors, and really, you know, spending time with your family. It It, it is truly, truly, I, I don't want to say demonic, but it, it really denies the fundamental dignity of every individual. Oh, good night. Six months. I mean, I mean, there's a lot that can happen in six months. I mean, you could have a, a new breakthrough and uh, a treatment that would possibly cure the person. In fact, Emily, I know of someone who uh, was a wonderful woman. In fact, she was a friend of mine. Uh, she was terminally ill with cancer. They gave her two, maybe three months to live. She wanted to fight it. She did. And they came out with a new drug to treat cancer. She went ahead and took this drug. It expanded her life by more than two years, two years. But if she had lived in Nevada, which, by the way, she did live in Nevada, and this bill had been law, she could be dead right now. She could have been prescribed this, this assisted suicide medication and be dead. What if the person was going through depression, Emily? Uh, were there any requirements in this bill that would have required them to have like, you know, three, four five months of counseling, uh, psychological sessions to make sure they just weren't going through depression? No, there is no mandatory counseling, no mandatory psychological evaluation. One might think that that would be an obvious requirement for someone requesting suicide for a deadly drug to be uh, assessed, evaluated, to go through counseling. There's not even a mandatory waiting period. It can be waived. You can request and receive this deadly experimental cocktail on the same day. And, and we do have the records from states like Oregon where... Frankly, the referrals for psychological evaluation, because they're optional, are rare. They're the exception. There have been years in Oregon where literally not a single patient, not a single patient who requested suicide was referred for psychological evaluation. It, it is shocking. And because we have this evidence, we, we know that what seems instinctively obvious is played out, in fact. Well, finally, Emily, uh, what's the big good news? Did this bill pass? Was it signed into law? That is the big good news. No. Our governor, Governor Lombardo, vetoed this bill, and we are so grateful to him. He unfortunately had to veto quite a few 
terrible bills coming out of the legislature this session. And it's really been celebrated by those who value life, who believe in the dignity of all people and respect for all individuals, regardless of wealth, regardless of status, regardless of health. However, I will say it is not a good sign that our governor had to literally break the record in Nevada with a record-breaking 75 vetoes. Some people are calling him Governor Vito Lombardo. It is not a good sign of a healthy legislature, but I will say it is a good sign that our state had the good sense to elect a governor who respects and values life and who was willing to do the unpleasant but necessary work of vetoing deadly legislation. And we are so grateful to our governor and to everyone in our state who voted, who voted for life and voted for a governor that would stand up to this deadly regime and say no Nevada deserves better than suicide. People, people who are facing a terminal diagnosis, they deserve hope. They deserve help. They deserve a hand and support. They do not deserve to be authored, offered a deadly cocktail. Well, Emily, thank you for the good news. And I want to remind folks that had this governor not been elected in the last election, we would have probably had a different outcome, a hideous outcome when it comes to individuals in crises uh, facing potential termination of, of life. This, is, this just goes to show you how important it is for you as people who are concerned about life, have a biblical worldview, for you to register to vote and to vote. Uh, it has an impact. It also shows, though, how important it is for the work of attorneys like Emily Mimnall working for Pacific Justice Institute to weigh in against bills like this and how they can be stopped and we can't have victory. Now, folks, we've looked at what the law says. Now let's take a look at what the Word of God says. At the end of the day, folks, that's the most important as followers of the Lord. So first, let's take a look at Ecclesiastes 7.17. It says, Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? And the, the stress here is on the phrase, your time. The fact is, we all have a time, a time to live and a time to die. It's a time. God has that time. It's not something he's given us to decide. We can't just simply commit suicide. No, God's word is very clear. We're not to take our lives. This is God to determine. We're to live all the way up to the time that God has appointed us to live for his glory uh, and for his pleasure. Psalm 34, 17 through 20. That passage says, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and, and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all of his bones. Not one of them is broken. First, this is an acknowledgement that even the righteous, even followers of the Lord can go through hard times. But folks, when we go through these hard times, the Lord is still with us. He hasn't given up on us. The disciples, the Apostle Paul, for example, they went through hard times. But God was with them. He never forsook them. He will never forsake us. He will be with us even until the end. In addition, God wants to use these hard times in our life. I don't know about you, but when I've gone through hard times, uh, real tragic times, it's those times when I draw closer to God than ever before. And it's those times when I draw closer to God that God speaks to me the loudest. And I hear his voice. And it has the most sanctifying work in my life, these hard times. We need to have that understanding that when we go through hard times, that's not the time for our heads to, be, to go down. It's the times for our head to go up and to look at the Lord and to cling to the Lord like never before. We will be blessed and God will be glorified no matter what the times we're going through, even if those are the times approaching our final time of termination on earth and being with the Lord for eternity. So folks, is life important to God? Yes. And it should be important to us as believers. Uh, not only for ourselves in making 
decisions when we go through depression, when we go through hard times, but also out of love for those in our society who may not know the Lord, who may, who may be going through depression, who may be tempted to commit suicide. And we, need, out of love, need to be outspoken for them. Uh, we need to be outspoken in our legislatures. We need to be outspoken at the ballot box. Folks, if it matters to God, it should matter to us. And the love of Christ should compel us to do nothing less than to speak out for the sanctity of human life. So folks, as believers, we're going to go through some hard times. But no matter what we're going through, always, always remember, keep the faith.